It's Thursday, April 15th, 2021, and we're going to talk about Cardano. Get ready. Let's go. Item number one. Okay, this is going to be a two-parter. I'm going to show you two different things. They're inter interconnected. So here we have Occamfy, who we've covered a couple different times on this channel. Uh, Occamfy tweeted the hashtag OCC, hashtag Occam Razor, IDO sold out in under 30 seconds. The OCC token is now available on Uniswap here with the link to Uniswap. IDO is initial DEX offering, initial DEX offering. So the Cardano community had a certain reaction to this, right? And I would say there's a spectrum of reactions as with all things, but I'm going to show you one that stuck out to me. This is DC, Dwayne Cameron of Liquid Protocol, also sort of in the DeFi Cardano space. He tweeted out, I get asked almost daily why Liquid Finance is opting for a fair token launch in event instead of a 2017 era ICO slash presale. Answer, we want our token launch to be a fair and structured process that any Cardano wallet user can easily access. So the exact opposite of this debacle. And then down below, he's referencing this tweet from Rick Waltman. Everyone should think about what they've just done. This is a reply to Occam Phi. Number one, tuned the IDO for 175 participants, knowing full well the community size and demand to expect. Number two, instantly follow up that IDO with a uni listing, knowing demand and FOMO would bleed over. Guess who's getting rich? Not users. <laughs> so this is kind of our first taste of a, uh, a project being launched with a token, you know, related to the Cardano ecosystem. And you can see there are a variety of opinions on whether or not, you know, all ways of doing this are okay, or some are less desirable than others. I will leave it up to you to form your own opinion. Number two, I love these kind of items. It seemed like no matter how much we on the inside of the Cardano community could see how how much progress Cardano was making and how far along we were and how much innovation was happening inside our space, it seemed like we did not get good coverage from the crypto press, you know, for for whatever you think of of that, you know, collective term, the crypto press. We were not getting great coverage. Here we have though something awesome. Coin Telegraph has an article called "Life Beyond Ethereum: What Layer One Blockchains Are Bringing to DeFi." And thank you for this, Antonio Madera, because this article is very positive. True, they mentioned Binance Smart Chain first, <laughs> right? They mentioned Binance Smart Chain first. I'm sure they're saying they're going in alphabetical order because we got Binance Smart Chain, Cardano, Ergo, and then Waves. Right, Waves didn't even get a title. Ergo, Cardano, and Binance Smart Chain. At least they got bold titles. Waves doesn't even have a bold title down here. I think the Waves, the Waves piece starts starts down here. But anyways, they did car cover Cardano and Ergo, and they're kind of like just laying out, you know, the ways in which these projects have created innovation over Ethereum, and you know, with a focus on the fact that. Uh, they're going to be, these projects are probably, you know, probably going to be able to achieve better scalability on layer one without having to talk about all the crazy layer two stuff that Ethereum's doing. Not that we couldn't do and aren't going to do all the layer two stuff on these other protocols as well on Cardano. I think we can still do all the layer two stuff. We just have a better layer one. So kind of an interesting line here, uh, right down here in the last paragraph on Cardano. However, many researchers, they're talking about EUTXO, which we covered in depth yesterday. However, many researchers believe EUTXO is equivalent to moving from 8-bit to 64-bit. This is exactly what we've been saying all along. 
but it's been the rare article that would put something like this into print. And I appreciate you doing this, Antonio Madera, because I think that is really the truth. I think we have here is a wholesale improvement. And I had an 8-bit Nintendo. And let me tell you, while I love that thing and I have very nostalgic memories for it, I still own that console. It is not something that can hold a candle to 64-bit. In terms of sheer fun, sure. In terms of graphics, anything else, no. 64-bit, way better. And I think that's what we're seeing with the Cardano Layer 1 versus Ethereum Layer 1 and probably Ethereum 2.0 Layer 1. So also some good info here on Ergo. I won't go into it. If you'd like to read this, I'd say hit up this article in Cointelegraph. Okay, item number three is gonna be uh, something a little bit different. We're going to talk about a thought, not T-H-O-T, you misogynistic dirty boys. I mean, T-H-O-U-G-H-T, a thought, a, a little bit of thinking. We're gonna talk about a certain way of thinking. I'm going to propose to you that the crypto knowledge stack as to adoption is actually tripartite, even though we try to pretend like there's only one element there. What do I mean by that? So what I mean is, uh, one of the things we're always trying to do is figure out how fast crypto adoption is gonna take, right? Because it's, it's, it's kind of our one of our big measures of progress, how fast people are adopting crypto, right? It's like, how close is it before everybody I know is using crypto in the same way we went from you know few people using email in the 90s to every single person using email now how long is that going to take right so i think we really have three different chips in the stack of understanding how fast this this progression is taking those chips are a technical chip a crypto sentiment chip and a legacy sentiment chip so the technical chip is exactly what you think it is, right? You have to understand why, if you were to predict the CryptoKitties failure of the Ethereum network, you would have to understand a tiny bit at least, technically why the Ethereum network could not handle CryptoKitties back in the day, right? You had to have some level of technical acumen, right? And I'm not saying we all need to become high level coders or programmers, but what I am saying is that you probably need to be, you know, fairly technically savvy. And I think the average crypto person is more technically savvy than the average person out there. But I think for myself, the way I'm trying to deepen my understanding of this part of the crypto adoption knowledge stack is by spending the amount of time I personally can devote to learning some programming, right? And so I think for everybody, this, this is probably a different amount of time. For you, it might be 10 minutes a week, it might be 10 minutes a day, it might be two hours a day, it might be you know, one hour a month. Whatever it is, I think if you devote a little bit of time to picking a programming language, any common language, and just put a little time into that. If you don't have a programming background, and learning a little bit about programming, that's probably gonna deepen your understanding of this part of the knowledge stack as to adoption. So I talk about my learning Haskell all the time, probably the worst Haskell learner ever, but I'm putting some time into it because I wanna deepen my, my understanding of this chip, so I won't go into that here, but you'll hear me talk about my attempts at learning Haskell all the time. Number two is the piece I think we already probably do a pretty good job at. Probably everybody listening to this right now spends a certain amount of time surfing crypto reddit crypto twitter crypto youtube you know and a lot of that crypto social media surfing is probably related to the moon boy price prediction stuff which you know let's face it it's very satisfying to watch that stuff but it's probably a very dubious worth a lot of it some i'm sure some of it's great and you know you know every once in a while somebody's going to hit one of their predict predictions perfectly but you know largely I think it's probably not unfair to say that a lot of the dudes doing that kind of price prediction stuff don't know what the hell they're doing. And um, that's part of why we don't do it here. We never do the price prediction thing here or even talk about markets or price because 
it's pretty unreliable, right? You're not getting a lot of information. However, I think everybody also surfs all the rest of the crypto social media stuff and we get a good sense of the crypto sentiment. Where does everybody in, inside the crypto space think we are in regards to everything? You know, um, in regards to regulation, adoption, partnerships with industry, all those things, we learned all those things and the technical stuff too. You get a good sense of where a project is technically. Is Tezos keeping up with Polkadot and Cardano? Probably not. Is there any worthwhile technology in Tron? Probably not. But you can get an idea, wherever you fall on uh, the spectrum of beliefs about those things, you can inform that decision and inform that belief based on the crypto sentiment on those questions. And I think we all do a pretty good job of that. The third chip in the crypto knowledge stack as to adoption, I think we don't do a very good job at. And that third chip is the legacy sentiment towards crypto. And when I say legacy sentiment, I'm not just talking about Wall Street. I am talking about the financial sector and central banks as an extension of that financial sector. But I'm also talking about regulatory authorities and just the general sentiment of the general public. So the way I personally go about trying to gain a better grasp of that chip in the crypto knowledge stack is by spending some amount of time every week frequenting the macro fin twit type space by that i mean the guys and gals who are in macroeconomics and do stuff on social media uh, for me i'll watch real vision videos every once in a while with raul powell raul powell has uh, a certain <laughs> A lot of people in crypto hate him because he's not a crypto, he's not a Bitcoin maximalist, but he does represent that sort of like older, gen, I think he's an older Gen Xer, that older Gen, gen Xer audience who are on Wall Street. I mean, they control a lot, a lot of Wall Street. And um, he's one of those guys who's very open-minded and has come into the crypto space because he sees the innovation and the disruption we're gonna to bring to the financial world. And watching his perspective on things gives me an idea because they cover you know, Wall Street, central banks, tiny bit on regulatory authorities. And I think guys like him also represent sort of the general public who are curious about crypto, but don't really, you know, are just sort of in the process of learning what's actually going on. So that's the way I approach trying to develop a crypto knowledge stack as to the rate of adoption for what it's worth. And with that, I will see you tomorrow.